Thank you. I say thank you as if that applause was for me. But if it wasn't, just uh, humor me. Thank you very much, Skyline family. What a privilege it is to be with you again. It's always fun to be here. Cheryl and I both enjoy being part of what Jeremy and Janie are a part of and uh, gotten to know so many of the team members here and uh, love, 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 love you guys. Um, we are... We are hearing something. Um, so we, we are uh, in Pivot Weekend. You know what Pivot Weekend is? We are pivoting away from Thanksgiving toward, toward Christmas. Uh, how many of you have had your Christmas tree up before Thanksgiving? No, don't raise your hand. Don't admit that. Um, this is the weekend we're supposed to pivot. No, you can't. We did too, so it's all good. Uh, but a lot has happened uh, since I've been with you. Time flies. It's Christmas season already. Since I've been with you last time, we had a national election. Still want to talk about that. We also had the Dodgers win the World Series. I know you don't want to talk about that. I turned 70 since I was with you last. And uh, I know you're a little, little late in getting those cards in the mail, but uh, the address has not changed. Today, what we want to do is launch Christmas uh, as an official teaching series for the season, experiencing Christmas. Uh, and so the first, very first message is the one I'm going to share with you now, O Quam, all ye faithful. Now, some of you hear that, and you're thinking, uh, is that an old English way of saying come? I thought it was, O come, all ye faithful. No, a qualm is a doubt. In fact, there's almost tension in that, in that word, qualm and faithful, doubt and faithful, because those two things describe all of us. All of the participants in the Christmas narrative would say the same thing. They all have their qualms. A qualm is an uneasy feeling of doubt about what's going on. And when Christmas was going on 2,000 years ago, everybody was a little bit wondering. You know, we talk about the wonder of Christmas. It's kind of like the way we wonder about things too. We all know what it feels like to be torn between being faithful and being doubtful. Caught in the middle between faith and doubt. And when you're in the middle of that tension, you sometimes feel lost because you don't know which way to lean. We believe in God, but we don't like what's going on in our lives. And so this message, O qualm all ye faithful, it's for anybody who's felt that tension, which I guess would be all of us. For some in these rooms today, um, your marriage is on the rocks. And you know it, the person sitting next to you knows it, maybe nobody else knows it. And you both have faith that God can land another miracle, but you're pretty sure that the other one isn't looking to cooperate. And so what happens? You're stuck. Maybe you have a child who's wandered from the Christian moorings. And Christmas season brings that out loud and clear. And you get faith that God can bring them back. But it just seems like the more you pray, the further and further away they get. Away from faith. And you don't know what to do. Because you're stuck. Your bills might be higher than your income. And you know in your heart, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But you haven't seen one of those cows for a while. And you feel stuck. Your doctor may have given you a little hope for recovery. You know God can heal. But you've seen so many times in so many other situations where he has chosen not to. And you have your qualms about that. If you've ever felt like you're stuck in the middle of faith and doubt, you're like the guy in Mark chapter 9, verse 24. 
Immediately this guy, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe you can heal him, Jesus. I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. You read that and you think, is there a typo somewhere? The guy believes, but he doesn't? Welcome to the club. Working through our doubts is important because we all have. In fact, they actually help us become better Christians. If you never work through your doubts, if you never work around your doubts, you'll not be of much use to the other people in your oikos because all of them have had their doubts. Everybody else goes through times when they doubt that certain things that Jesus may have said could even be right. And if you say to anybody, wow, you got doubts about that stuff? I've never had any doubts. <laughs> Man, you say something like that, and you're not going to be able to relate to pretty much anybody because they all have had doubts. I've had my doubts. I've had my doubts about the Bible. I've had my doubts about Jesus. I've had my doubts about faith. Throughout my life, those doubts creep in. I mean, I have truly lived up to my namesake, Thomas, the doubter. You know, the disciples doubted. I guess we're in pretty good company. Jesus came to him in Luke 17, said, even if somebody sins against you seven times in the same day, and seven times that day comes back and says, hey man, I'm sorry. You gotta forgive them. Can you imagine that? You say, no, I can't imagine that. Well, neither could the disciples. And what was their response? We're gonna need more faith. They were stuck at that moment between their faith in Jesus as their rabbi, as their mentor, as their savior. And yet they were wondering, how are we ever going to do what he's asked us to do? And I'm not just talking about while he was teaching them and mentoring them. I'm talking about after. They saw him perform all these miracles, feed thousands of people on multiple occasions. After they watched him heal all these blind people and Deaf people and lame people. I'm talking about after they watched him raise Lazarus from the dead. I'm talking about after they saw Jesus die a brutal death on a Roman cross and then walk out of a grave. They saw Jesus himself resurrected. After all that, right? Matthew chapter 28. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, verse 16. The 11 disciples, they used to be 12. Judas fell off the wagon, and so they go to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some still <laughs> doubted. I just love that. I mean, why? By the way, why would Matthew even say that? Why would he even include that in the narrative? I mean, isn't it enough? Did you say they worshiped him? They just came together and they worshiped Jesus? I mean, then everybody can just do kumbaya and they close in prayer, go home happy. But he's got to drop that nuke and say, but some doubted. And I believe that that little tidbit of information is there because God wants you and I to know that it's par for the course. Ten verses later, Jesus would say, now, what I want you to do is go into all the world and bring spiritual transformation around the globe, the Great Commission. And before he gave the Great Commission, he didn't weed out the ones who doubted. He sent them out with their doubts. Why? Because we're all like that. We come into these rooms today, whether you're you know, here in, in uh, Rancho San Diego, whether one of the other campuses, we're all sitting in these auditoriums today. Many of us are even doubting right now something Jesus said. How could that possibly be right? We're doubting right now God's sovereignty over the, the lives that we're living because of what we're having to try to navigate through and the difficulties that we are asked, the challenges We've been extended, and we don't think God cares. We don't think he's there, and we doubt. 
John the Baptist doubted. John was the last Old Testament prophet. And Jesus' biological cousin. And one day he sees Jesus. And what does he say in John chapter 1? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then later on in Luke chapter 7 verse 19, some of John's followers come to Jesus and they say, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Sent there by who? John the Baptist himself. And that's not just doubting, man. You can sense desperation in his voice. And that's the thing about doubts. If you let them go unchecked, they always turn into desperation. Doubts lead to desperation. We all have our doubts, but don't let them lead you to desperation. And that's what's happened throughout biblical history. God's people have always had doubts. That's why you have doubts. That's why I have doubts. Andre Reznor says this, the struggle with God is not a lack of faith. It is faith. And when somebody says something that you have to read three times to understand what, it, what he's trying to say, there's something profound there. The struggle with God is not a lack of faith. It is faith. When we're frustrated with God, when we're frustrated with the way things are going down in our lives, when our prayers are reflective of someone who is doubting, it at least shows that we believe in God. This is all part of the faith journey. When I think of the nation of Israel about the time of Jesus' birth, it seems that the entire Jewish nation, that they were all doubting. It had been 400 years since Israel had officially heard anything from God. 400 years from the end of the Old Testament to that first Christmas morning, a gap of 400 years, no prophetic voice had even spoken, let alone been heard. No messianic signals had been sent. And the silence, God's silence was deafening to those people. And some held on to their legacy of belief, but so many of them had just given up because doubts that go unchecked lead to desperation. And if they continue to go unchecked, it leads to disengagement. If you can't work through your doubts, you, you sense this feeling of, of lostness that grows in your spirit and you pull away. You stop growing in your faith altogether. Now, why do I say all of that about doubts? Why do we give you the title to this presentation, O Quam All Ye Faithful? Because I want to talk about Joseph for a few minutes today. Mary's soon-to-be husband, the poster boy for giving up. And if he had given up, none of us would have blamed him. Can you imagine what was going through his mind? Look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. This is what happened. So his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. That's the official version. Here is the mercerized version. Joe, your fiance is pregnant with somebody else's baby, but this is not supposed to bother you. And I'm thinking, are you serious right now? And then remember all the information the angel gave Joseph. After that, 
came to him in a dream. All of the information, all of the plans about this whole salvation of the entire world, that somehow all of these circumstances are good, all came to Joseph in a dream, and yet the passage tells us. And I only mention that, the dream part, because so often we wake up from our dreams and we wonder, what was that about? But when Joseph woke up from that dream, verse 24, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. He didn't ask for a fleece like Gideon did. He didn't insist on another sign like the Pharisees would. It doesn't say Joseph even understood what was going on. It doesn't say he didn't have his doubts. I mean, from the very beginning, he was planning on terminating the relationship, ended in a gracious and very private way, okay, but still ended nevertheless. And so when I see that in his life, I ask myself the question, I wonder if there's something here for me, because I have my own doubts. What did he do that kept his doubts in check, kept him from becoming overwhelmed with his doubts and desperate, that kept him from disengaging from God's plan, throwing up his hands and saying, I'm sorry, God, I'm out. Did he do something that we could mimic? Was there a plan in play? That we could follow. Okay. So I'm going to give you five steps. And I think this is a plan to follow. Because Joseph shows it to us. And it worked pretty well for him. Are you ready? Fill in some blanks. Number one. Step number one. Listen to God's messenger. If you've got your doubts about any aspect. Of Christianity. About Jesus. Maybe about God's sovereign love. And his eternal concern for you, his sovereign ability as God? You got doubts? Listen to God's messenger. You know, everybody needs a messenger from God. Someone we are willing to believe God speaks to us through. The story tells us Joseph did what the angel said, even though it didn't make any practical sense to him at the time. He just did it. Okay, so he had an angel who told him to do it. And you and I are probably not going to get a literal angel to speak to us. Joseph got one, and that was awesome. But we probably won't have that luxury. But God will always send someone. And the question I have for you right now is this. Who is that someone for you? Who is that someone you will listen to? That someone you will allow to speak into your life no matter what? You would believe them and you would follow their advice. When you're desperate for encouragement because your doubts have gotten the best of you on any given day, <laughs> who is it? You know, it's funny. When we need encouragement the most, we're willing to listen to encouragement the least. Have you noticed that? The more down you are, the more disengaged you tend to want to be. When you're frustrated, when you're sad, when you're throwing yourself one of those pity parties that we've all thrown, and we don't have any invitations extended except ourselves. And we're sitting there wallowing in our self-pity. We don't want to go to church where we could be encouraged. We don't want to go to our small group. I don't feel like going tonight. When those people are the ones who would probably be the best thing for us, the encouragement we need the most. You notice that? The more we're discouraged, the more we tend to want to just not listen to anybody. And that's when we need to listen to somebody the most. You probably have a lot of people in your life who will tell you what you want to hear. But who would you listen to if they told you what you need to hear? 
over the years. People who sought me out for spiritual counsel, goes with the territory. That's one of the things that pastors are supposed to provide people. And so they'd come and say, Pastor Tom, would you meet with us? Would you meet with me? I need, I need some counsel. I'd like for you to provide some counseling. And the question I always ask immediately is this. Yeah, I'd be glad to meet with you, but the question I have is, before we get started, will you follow whatever advice I give you? And it is not uncommon to hear back, well, it depends on what the advice you give is. And so I would just be honest with them. I'd say, you know, we're just going to waste a lot of time here. You're going to waste my time. I'm going to waste your time. You need to find another counselor. A lot of times we say we're looking for wise counsel when we're not looking for anything but affirmation. We want somebody to <laughs> pat us on the back and say, yeah, you're right. Yeah, they were wrong. Yeah, you're a victim. That affirms us because that's where we're at right now. And you can always find someone who will agree with you, even if it takes a while. But what happens when you need to hear something you don't want to hear? Who do you seek out then? Who has that kind of authority in your life? No matter what they tell you, you will listen. And if you can't think of anybody right now, you're jacked up. Because we all need a messenger. People say, Tom, do you ever hear the audible voice of God? I say, absolutely. I hear it regularly. And it sounds exactly like Cheryl. <laughs> Cheryl is God's messenger to me. And you may be fortunate, like I am, to have married that kind of a messenger. Maybe you didn't. And maybe God will be speaking to you through someone else but everybody needs somebody but see this is step number one and if you've got nobody we can't even continue on the path to overcoming our doubts number two though let's say you got somebody number two give God the benefit of your doubts even while Joseph was doubting he gave God the benefit of that doubt and I think that really can be the bottom line here. I don't think we should feel badly about our doubt because it's a very natural thing to have our doubts. I'm just saying, why not give God the benefit of your doubt? You already give a lot of people in your life the benefit of your doubts. Just extend that same luxury to God. So how do you do that? Well, it's very simplistic to say, and it all boils down to making a decision to do something you don't feel like doing. That's all. And you're not making that decision in a vacuum. You're making that decision on the basis of what you already know about Jesus. He loves you with an eternal love. He's completely resourced. He has every resource in the cosmos available to him. Who else do you know? Who else do you know like that? Do you know anybody else in your life who has never hurt you? Who has never let you down? Is there anyone else in your life who loves you enough to give up a child for you? Is there anyone else in your life who has the resources God has? See, if we're going to give anybody, and I mean anybody, the benefit of our doubts in our lives, shouldn't it be Jesus? Look at these guys, John chapter 12, verse 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they saw him firsthand. It wasn't like they just heard a rumor about what Jesus did. They were watching it. They were on sight. And because they saw it with their own eyes, they certainly could believe in him. But what does the text say? They still would not believe. They could but they would not. Talk about a hardened heart. They just made a decision to not believe. After all of those miracles, they chose to not believe. You know, we all 
came into this world with a desire to only do what we want to do. Um, and we all came with this very sinful pride, equipped from the factory, ready to say no to any voice of authority or to any counselor. We don't want to hear it. We just want to do what we want to do. When I say we were, we were um, dead on delivery because of our sin nature, we were born with this sinful bent. That's why you never have to teach a child to say no. You ever notice that? Raise your hand. All campuses if you're a parent. Yeah, see, okay. <laughs> I feel very much at home with you right now because you didn't have to teach your kid to say no. You had to teach them how to say what? Yes. You don't have to teach a child how to say mine. You have to teach them how to share. My beautiful angelic grandchildren, God bless Cheryl and I with 11 of them. We just spent several days in Phoenix with them all over Thanksgiving. What a zoo. <laughs> These kids are all so fabulous. But nobody ever taught any one of those wonderful kids to say no. They said it clearly and often. Even to the things that would clearly benefit them. Their first response was no. And you know why our grandchildren are that way? Because that's the way their parents were. And our, our children were that way because that's Cheryl and me. I mean, this is just the way it is for all of us. And if we're not careful, we all tend to want to feed that contrarian, consistently rebellious heart. And that, that is why to every discussion of faith, rather than bringing a bent to rebel against that faith, we need to bring a desire to discover what is true and right about God. Number three, take control of your emotions. Take control of your emotions. You say, how do I give God the benefit of my doubts? Well, you just got to control your emotions. Joseph gave God the benefit of the doubt because he was able to, as C.S. Lewis described it, discipline his emotions. C.S. Lewis wrote in The Joyful Christian, and I'm quoting him now. This is C.S., and I wish I had a British accent to make it sound like him, but I don't. Now, faith, in the sense in which I am here using the word, is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. For moods will change, whatever your reason takes. I know that by experience. Now that I am a Christian, I do have moods in which the whole thing looks very improbable. But when I was an atheist, I had moods in which Christianity looked terribly probable. This rebellion of your moods against your real self is going to come anyway. That is why faith is such a necessary virtue. Unless you can teach your moods where they get off, you can never be either a sound Christian or even a sound atheist, but just a creature dithering to and fro with its beliefs really dependent on the weather and the state of its digestion. Consequently, one must train the habit of faith. End of quote. Training the habit of faith. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's nice that we have step number four, isn't it? Because Joseph shows us, do what faith would do. See, when you have a choice because you're doubting, you know what God says and you know what your feeling is right, always do what God says. Always do what faith would do. Back in Luke 17, that same passage, we looked at briefly a few minutes ago. It says, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And he replied, 
If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the small berry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you, even with a little bit of faith. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, no, you prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me. I'm the master, you're the servant. I'm the one who's going to eat and drink. And then after I'm done, you can eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. You know, there's a lot there. Basically, what Jesus is saying is simple. Servants don't call the shots. That's what he's saying. Servants do what they're told. See, we don't need any more of anything than we already have to do the next right thing. When we look at options and we know what faith would do and we say, I can't do that. Really what we're saying is I won't do that. Even when the disciples said, you got to give us more faith, Jesus. Jesus gave this little parable to, to establish, no, you don't need anything more than what you already have to do what faith would do. You just have to what? You got to do it. John 7, verse 17, anyone who chooses to do the will of God, and it's a choice. Anyone who chooses to do what faith would do will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. If you make a choice to do what Jesus said is right, even if you feel like it's a little bit sideways and it's a little bit questionable and you're beginning to doubt, only when you follow through and choose what faith would choose will you even know if God is worth listening to. And if you choose not to do what faith would do, then your doubts get the best of you. And if you don't change that pattern, your life trajectory begins to bend in the wrong direction. And unchecked faith leads to desperation, which in turn leads to disengagement. Always do what faith would do. And so you ask, well, exactly what does that look like? Which is why it's nice we have our last step in the process. It all boils down to number five. Be quick about it. Be quick about it because there is power in promptness. Especially when you're fearful. Especially when you're doubting. You recognize what faith would do. Don't hesitate. Because the longer you linger, the less likely you'll respond. And so your pastor challenges you to invite someone from your oikos to one of the Christmas Eve services. Now, I know Pastor Jeremy. Pastor Jeremy thinks all like I think, thinks all like all pastors think. You extend the invitation to the church family to invite someone in the oikos, and you know that many will and many will not. And why do the ones who will follow through while the ones who do not, do not follow through? It's because the ones who do not are waiting for more faith. You want us to do that, pastor, God's going to have to increase our faith. You know, Christmas Eve is three weeks away. What are you waiting for to invite someone from your oikos to one of those services? The one you are planning to attend. When God directs us to do something that we actually want to do, we don't hesitate. When you, we don't want to do it because it pushes us maybe a little outside of our comfort zone, what do we say? We say, you know what? We're waiting on God. We're just going to pray about it. And I'm saying, what are you praying for? I mean, what information are you going to get next week or in two weeks that you don't have right now? You know when the Christmas Eve services are. Are you waiting for God to reveal who to invite? You already know. You got an oikos list, don't you? You got people who need Jesus, right? The invitation is not something that you have to wait to extend. And all I'm saying is there's power and promise. 
And next week when you're encouraged by someone from the Friendly Skyline team to, hey, you guys, invite somebody to Christmas Eve services, it becomes a little more difficult. And the chances of you following through become a little less. And over time, a little less still. And then you wake up one morning, like three or four days before Christmas, and even if you extend the invitation, they're busy, right? So don't wait. What keeps us from the joy of obedience? Our doubts. Our fear of failure. The story tells us that as soon as Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. When Joseph woke up, see, what is God's strategy to overcome doubts? Discover what faith would do and be quick. I want to close this service in a little strange, in a strange way. Um, and you have come to expect that maybe from me. I just took something out of my pocket. I'm not a magician. But I just took something out of my pocket and I put it in my hand. And you didn't even know it. There's something in my hand. You don't know what it is. So I'm going to tell you because I want you in the loop. In my hand is a quarter. You haven't seen the quarter. I'm just telling you. The quarter is in my hand. In fact, all campuses, turn to the person next to you right now and say to them, Tom has a quarter in his hand. Go ahead. Okay, now that was an easy exercise. If you meant that when you said that, you know what the Bible calls it? Faith. Um, now faith, the writer of Hebrews tell us, tells us, Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You haven't seen the quarter. But there is some assurance that deserves your attention. Number one is that whatever it is that is in my hand came out of my pocket, and dudes tend to at times carry quarters in their pocket. You know what that is? That's evidence. Here's another piece of evidence. Tom is a pastor, and he's Jeremy's good friend. He wouldn't lie to us. Doesn't Tom deserve the benefit of your doubts as to what is in my hand? I will answer that. Yes, Tom deserves the benefit of your doubts. So what do we have here? We have more evidence. See, you have some assurance, but you still haven't seen it. You've been subjected to, as the writer of Hebrew says, the assurance of what you do not see. And there still might be a little bit of doubt in your mind but you're giving me the benefit of your doubt. Okay, right now I'm going to destroy your faith. Are you ready? There it is. The quarter that you've waited to see for so long. See, you don't need any more faith that Tom has a quarter in his hand because you now have what? You now have sight. You now can see the quarter. You know what Joseph understood? God values faith more than he values sight. Most Christians want to see the quarter in God's hand before they start to tithe. But that's not faith, and that's why it's not going to happen that way. A lot of God's children want to see the quarter in God's hand before they decide to work on their marriage. But that's not faith. And that's why it's not going to happen that way. A lot of people want to see the quarter in God's hand before they decide to move forward in any aspect of their life. But that's not faith. And that's why it's not going to happen that way. You can just ask Joseph, who even though he couldn't see the quarter, he did what the Lord commanded him to do. I guess you could say that Joseph didn't need to see the quarter. And I'm just asking you, are you that way? What if Joseph was on this stage reflecting on all this right now? What if he was actually a guest at this service? And I said, hey, Joe, come on up and explain to these people what your reflections are looking back. After all these years and seeing what God has accomplished in the world. Because people like you didn't need to see the quarter. Do you think Joseph would say things worked out pretty well? I think he would. 
And I just want to leave you with this thought. The same God, the exact same God that Joseph served is the God you and I serve. And that God is writing an amazing story in your life and in my life right now. And it may be hard for us to understand that right now. It may be hard for us to even process that right now. And that's why we have these doubts. But always, always, always be suspicious. But even though you can't see it, God is still up to something really good and really powerful. Let's bow for prayer. Thank you, Father, giving us an opportunity, even a day, to reflect a little bit on, on our faith or lack of it. Lord, we have all these testimonies of faith in your word, and it really isn't anything that they did that we can't do. Certainly not something that you gave them that you haven't given us in terms of spiritual power or opportunity or even a path to follow. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to each one of us, whether we're talking about inviting somebody to Christmas Eve or whether we're talking, Lord, about doing something else in our life that would be an act of faith. Let us be quick. Let us be prompt. Let us not wait. Because in your economy, you reveal yourself to us after we make a choice that is a choice based on faith. Some of you are watching or listening today and, and maybe you're wondering why would these people even put their faith in Jesus? And all I can say from experience is I just wish you knew Jesus like I knew Jesus. Because even in our humanity, when we struggle and when we doubt, he always comes through. His love is like no other. His provision, the purpose, the peace he provides. The grace he offers us is just flat out amazing. And if you will admit that you're a sinner and you need help and you know you need help, if you believe that God sent one Savior in the world to offer you help and that Savior was Jesus Christ, and if you'll admit your sin and believe in Jesus and choose to place your faith in him, put your faith in him and let God show you that that faith is not misplaced. And when he reveals the quarter to you, you're going to be thankful that you made that choice and took that step. And Father, I pray that uh, you would just move in all of our hearts. You know where we're at. You know where we need to go. And Father, just help us to get there. And uh, we pray that this Christmas season would be the best we ever had as we not only feel your presence, but offer your presence to others. In Jesus' great name, all God's children said, amen. Well, we're going to hand it back to our campus pastors now. I want to say thank you for uh, coming once again. And now to him who was able to do exceeding abundantly beyond anything I could explain to you. Anything you could even come up with. Anything you could even ask for or imagine. According to the power that is in you. Through Christ Jesus. God bless you and have a great week. You may now go home.